Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to Bridges of Belonging. This is conversation number five and uh, so thrilled to have uh, Marco and Dina join us today on this call and to share their perspectives in their own journeys of belonging. So to do a little bit of housekeeping first, um, we are recording this session. So uh, if you're uncomfortable with that, you can change your name or not put your uh, picture up throughout and please stay muted and um, keep your video off during the actual presentation. But as we get to questions, we welcome people to turn those on and to sh share in the chat box throughout. I do want to begin by acknowledging the territory that I'm on today, which is um, the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people of the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations here in Victoria. And I know we have people joining us from across the country that uh, are on various territories. And so acknowledging the great stewardship that um, the nations across the country have taken and ensuring that we have safe places to be during this challenging time of our lives. And it's also Indigenous History Month this month. So if you don't know what territory you're on, this is a really great opportunity to spend a little bit of time uh, researching that and figuring that out and learning a little bit about um, some of the history of that territory and those nations. So again, just a welcome to the session. My name is Andrea Carey and uh, I am the Chief Inclusion Officer with Inclusion Incorporated. And um, as I said, this is conversation number five of Bridges of Belonging. And these have been just really beautiful, vulnerable conversations from week to week. And uh, this week looks like it will be another great conversation. And I just really um, have so much time and respect for both Dina and Marco and really excited to share this with you. So we're going to kick off with a reading as we usually do. This week I've chosen a reading from Martin Luther King's book that came out in 1967. Um, and I have uh, been kind of working my way back through this as we've been uh, dealing with some of the challenging racial situations that have emerged in the last little while and just reflecting on some of his wise words from many years ago that continue to be so relevant today. So I'm just going to read this little piece and then we'll introduce our speakers formally. One of the great liabilities of history is that all too many people fail to remain awake through great periods of social change. Every society has its protectors of the status quo and its fraternities of the indifferent who are notorious for sleeping through revolutions. But today, our very survival depends on our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and to face the challenge of change. The large house in which we live demands that we transform this worldwide neighborhood into a worldwide brotherhood. Together, we must learn to live as brothers or together we'll be forced to perish as fools. So as I um, was reflecting on this book, that one just really stood out to me today and I wanted to share that and just think about how do we take the learnings from right now and um, use them to motivate ourselves and to embrace what can be as we go forward and how we connect with each other and create those spaces and places where everyone can belong. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our two speakers. So Marco is an award-winning entrepreneur, accessibility consultant and inspirational speaker who has cerebral palsy. Throughout his life, Marco has been involved with a number of organizations. Oh, there's a situation. Someone's unmuted, just a second. Um, number of organizations as a spokesperson helping to spread advocacy for people with disabilities across Canada. As an accessibility and inclusion consultant, he's worked for some of BC's biggest change-driven business leaders who are champions for more accessible, inclusive workplaces. It's through these experiences that he's helping to pave a way for all Canadians to have universal access to the programs, services, and places that we live, work, and play. And I had the great uh, pleasure of serving on a board with Marco a couple of years ago and just really uh, always valued and appreciated the perspective he brought and in connecting with him over the last few weeks planning for this was reminded about how remarkable he is and I'm really looking forward to sharing him with you all today. Um, Dina is an Integral Master Coach with Integral Coaching Canada and is also certified with the International Coach Federation. 
She's been working in sports since 1991 as an executive director, communication specialist, and sport consultant. She is co-owner of Sport Law and Strategy Group, and through her work, Dina works with sport leaders, coaches, and athletes to enhance their leadership capacity, emotional intelligence, and presence. More recently, Dina is back at school studying death and loss through Western University's King's College to bring more literacy to this important topic, both in sport and beyond. Dina is part of a dozen um, international events, including five Olympic Games and three Pan American Games. Dina and her husband, Pierre, are the grateful parents of three children who she believes are her greatest teachers. And Dina has been an incredible force in my life as well, particularly over the last few months and um, just really helping me kind of shape some of the things that I believe in and checking in on my values. So I'm grateful to have both of you here today. We um, are going to kick off with just getting to know both of you a little bit more. So um, Marco, I'm going to turn it over to you to get us started and just share a little bit more in depth about who you are, what your lived experience has been, and just let people get to know you. Okay, well, thank you so much, first and foremost, Andrea, for having me on uh, your show. I think that uh, it's truly incredible to show that after years and years of uh, knowing each other, we have an opportunity here to really connect in this capacity. And the idea of belonging is something that's always been important to me, something that um, the viewers wouldn't know from me based on the bio that you read is that my background is actually in video game design and uh, that's what I have my degree is in video game design and, and designing virtual worlds but I'm no longer uh, pursuing that career because actually uh, this parallels what we're going through today uh, in 2010 when the recession hit I actually lost my job in the game industry along with 2,500 other people in the company that I was working for and that was really an eye-opener for me because that helped me to understand that through challenge, you can truly find yourself and you can truly find where you belong and how you belong. And that was the big eye-opener for me because had I not been laid off during a recession, much like we're experiencing with staying at home these days, I never would have made the jump, the shift uh, to find what I was truly made of and truly capable of. And it was my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, uh, Karen, who you've met. Uh, who really encouraged me uh, to go out there and do what I was meant to do. And, sh and I said, well, what is that? And she said, inspire people. I, I think that you could go out there and start a business as a speaker. And that's not something that you'd really be able to do with your game industry experience. And that was the beginning of the rest of my life. And I, I don't regret it for one second. So for anyone who's doubting right now that they're, they're kind of feeling lost or that there isn't a sense of belonging, know that even in our most troubling times, even in our most challenging times, uh, we can find elements and sides of ourselves that we didn't know existed. And I'm living proof of that. So I'm really excited to share a little bit more about my story and sort of what kind of brought me to where I am today. Fantastic. Thank you. That's a good kickoff for us. Um, Dina, I'm going to flip it over to you to share a little bit about your story. Hey, well, I just want to hear more about Marco. <laughs> I love Karen because it feels like she, I don't even know who Karen is, but it sounds like she was the spark in your life that helped you um, hmm, live up to your full potential, your true calling. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what a beautiful bridge, actually, Marco, around uh, when I feel most at home is when I feel safest. And when I feel safest, more of me can become present. And maybe um, that's, that gives you a clue to what matters most to me. So um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a parent of three kids. And that's typically what I start with. It's where I feel most alive and, and most at home. Um, I'm also still um, married to my high school sweetheart. So that also gives you a clue around my deep attachment to um, people that matter to me. So people and places are really important. And in fact, Andrea, I don't know if you know this about me, but um, so 20 years ago, I had one of those aha moments. So Marco, for you, it was um, is when you lost your job and then you've reaped the benefits through these rich gifts. Uh, for me, it's when my sister died. My younger sister, Tracy, died when she was only 29, a brand new mom. And, uh, and that was like a life-altering moment for me. And what I can share 19 years later is in, in that journey of discovery, um, I found out who I really was. And that got expressed through my values of courage and compassion and community. 
So everything that I stand for, everything that I do, um, my systems of belief always come back to those three core values. And I have used them to nourish um, uh, all my choices, my decisions, and hopefully they, they are reflected in my actions. So what I would offer is, you know, feeling like I belong, feeling like my voice matters, like I can make a difference too, that I can shape um, the and co-create the experience that I'm in is so fundamentally part of who I am. And it turns out, as we channel, you know, the voices of our deep sages, like Martin uh, Luther King, um, like Maya Angelou, amazing, eh? two black people um, that we're bringing in as voices on the call, who says we feel safest when we go inside ourselves and find home. We feel safest when we go inside ourselves and find home, a place where we belong and maybe the only place we really do. So an invitation, you know, a way that I'd love to hold this conversation today is, um, in what ways am I allowing myself to show up fully? In what ways am I creating a sense of belonging within myself, such as I can create meaningful, healthy relationships with others, and how together then we can transform the places of belonging in which we're working or playing or volunteering or showing up. So maybe that's a little bit about um, who I want to share a little bit more about me beyond the, you know, I'm a parent and a spouse and a professional. How does that sound, Andrea? Dang, that's brilliant, Dina. I'm going to uh, kind of go into that a little bit. So two pieces um, in that really stood out for me that I want to dive into a little bit. So one, finding home. Like, what does that look like for you? And how does that show up in the work you do, in the people you engage with, in sort of your journey? So I'll let you go first, and then we'll maybe ask Marco that same question. Okay. I think, um, so finding home, feeling like I too matter, um, I think really uh, hit home when I, I experienced not mattering or not belonging. And I know you're going to take us there later on. Um, but I think there's something really profound and beautiful to experience those dark moments of not belonging. And then your heart has two options as I see it. You can constrict and become bitter and angry and then force onto others what you yourself don't want to experience. Or you can sit in quiet reflection and go, huh, so now what am I going to do about it? And so for me, belonging, I think that really that epicenter of wanting to create um, systems and structures and relationships of belonging revealed themselves through that dark time when Tracy died. And as a result of that, um, my whole career was shaped. I left sport as a longtime press chief and contributor and then created a new roadmap for myself where I could self-determine what that was going to look like. Um, and then I did a lot of study on self and I did that through becoming an integral master coach. And, and when you study as an integral master coach, you, you step into much like a black belt would, you step into the experience of becoming, you know, a first Dan, second Dan, third Dan with a humble heart and a curious mind and a deep, um, unquestionable and unquenching thirst for um, whatever is bringing you with the other person. Like what, whatever the space is between us, that's how we, we step into that kind of conversation. So I would say that um, that house was forged in fire through a very difficult time. And then through the the daily lived experience of being in questioning of myself, my values, my longings, my fears. Um, I, I became more accepting of myself and shone a lot more deep love and compassion. And the minute you start doing that, the minute you start to create this sense of I'm at home in who I am in this beautiful skin, in this beautiful life, in this beautiful body, in this beautiful way. Um, and then how can I shine that light in service of others, which is 
part of what, you know, lights me up. Did that respond to your question? That was perfect. <laughs> you always have such a lovely way of putting everything that just uh, brings sort of calm and clarity and um, yeah, your use of words always uh, just kind of enriches how I experience our time together. It's the journalist in me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It comes in handy throughout life. Um, Marco, how about you? Like, what does finding home look like for you? You've obviously also experienced some dark times. So has that been an um, influencer or how has that shown up for you? And, um, yeah. you know, Dina referenced Karen, who I also think is fantastic. So yes, absolutely. tell us a little bit about your finding home. Sure. Uh, well, I'm sure you've heard the token phrase, uh, home is where the heart is. And so, and I truly feel like uh, that is uh, my relationship with Karen through and through. We've been together now uh, 13 years and, uh, and we've been married six years. Uh, and it's one of those really interesting things. And I'll dive a little bit into this a little bit later about how Karen and I met through the Active Living Alliance for Canadians with Disabilities, which is the organization that you and I sat on the board for. They used to do their exchange. I can go into that a little bit later. But I wanna to touch on being a person with a disability for a second. Um, you know, being born with a disability, uh, cerebral palsy for me, and that was brain damage at birth, which affects uh, my two legs and my right arm. I have something called spastic triplegia. So um, I use a manual wheelchair the majority of the time to get around. And, you know, as I grew up, I really, I struggled with feeling a sense of belonging and a sense of home, at least in the early stages of my life. Um, because there were so many things that were telling me that I didn't belong or that I was different. And the world, especially uh, in the uh, late 80s, early 90s, it wasn't really the topic of diversity, inclusion, and, and bringing your whole self to a picture was just not in the picture yet. And so I, I struggled with that. But I think what really helped me to kind of pull through that is to recognize that we all each have a unique perspective to bring to the table. And in fact, uh, my disability was not a disadvantage, but it actually could be a platform for positive change. It was something that I actually resisted for a very long time. And to, to go back, uh, fast forward a little bit and talk about when I lost my job and then discovering, well, what could I do as a speaker to help inspire people? People go, well, where's the connection there about working with employers and, and you know, inclusivity and all these things? It was literally, I denied that side of my life forever. I didn't want to be pigeon held as somebody with a disability that was only talking about disability or accessibility related things because I first and foremost wanted to belong as a human being, as a person, as Marco Pasqua, the guy, first. Uh, and respected as an entrepreneur as I went through and the practices that I could teach other people. But it was actually my interacting with a longtime mentor and friend, Rick Hansen. Rick is a guy who's inspired me my entire life. And I've had the great pleasure of working him, with him uh, for many, many years. And he was the one who encouraged me to say, you got to stop looking at this as something that has been put onto you. You have to look at this as an opportunity to use this as a platform for changing people's perspectives. And although you bring all these insights as a business leader, you can also bring these insights around accessibility and around inclusion and around belonging and diversity in a way that other people wouldn't be able to frame, or at least you could help to reshape the way in which they frame. And so it's through people like Karen and Rick and many other mentors in my life who've really shown me that home is wherever I take myself and wherever I help to open up the eyes of other people. And I really hope that that creates a, a sense of inclusion and belonging for everyone that I talk to, regardless if they don't understand my perspective. It's to, it's to understand that everyone who's listening in today, you each bring a unique perspective that I can't place myself in your shoes. But if we can have a amazing conversation where you can give me insights about what it's like to live your life and walk a mile in your shoes, then I'll give you the opportunity to do that. And you can offer me the opportunity to do the same. And we can find some parallels there and create a home for everyone where everyone belongs. Mm, yeah, wow, that's fantastic. Um, your reference and experience around, your lived experience around a disability, and Dina, your lived experience around sort of grief and how those have shaped who you are and how you show up in the world and the beautiful influences that you both have 
in the various spaces and places that you now live and um, create for yourselves and bring to the rest of the world are, you know, just both phenomenal. So that was sort of the other piece I wanted to dive into in Dina's opening remarks, sort of those co-creating experiences. So Marco, in the work you're doing and sort of being a keynote speaker and an influencer and an advocate for disability and um, looking at accessibility more broadly, how are you, how do you bring your lived experience to kind of co-create experiences for others to engage and appreciate what is needed in order to make others feel like they belong? Well, simply put, I would say it's the art of being a storyteller. Uh, I think that no matter what you do in your life and however you want to frame your life, it's being able to put people in your shoes by framing a story. So when I talk on a stage about what it's like to have cerebral palsy and use a manual wheelchair and how barriers are actually created by the environment, not necessarily by my disability, but the environment around me, I don't expect somebody to immediately identify with that exact experience that happened to me. My goal is actually to illustrate a way in which is so universal that a moment for that person pops into their head and they go wait a minute I had a moment where my grandfather inspired me to do something similar I remember being pushed on a swing when I was a kid and that's where you have those aha moments and that's where you bridge the gap because truly to be a speaker is just to deliver a message and be a vessel for that message. So my goal in all the work that I do, whether I'm speaking on a sp stage or writing it in a blog or helping a business leader help to open up their perspectives on what it means to be a diverse employer and actually hire individuals with disabilities, it's to give them the perspective and the insight that by bringing this more diverse voice into your life and by being able to bring in your own experiences, whatever those are for you, then you know then you understand truly what it means to belong and and so for me uh, being able to give those moments those aha moments to people through storytelling i think has been the most exciting part because it's not an ego thing it's not about me and my story and da, 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 da. it's actually about how we all have very similar stories you just have to reframe them differently and that's truly where some of my work has really started to shine is people go wait a minute you're speaking to me because something similar has happened to me. And if this matters to me and this matters to my family, then ultimately we can come together as professionals and bring in those different insights to, to help different levels of understanding, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that's, um, that's really well put. And finding those sort of, yeah, shared experiences and threads that tie us all together, despite our differences and despite sort of what those lived experiences might be, um, your gift to kind of find that catalyst to bring people together is really beautiful. Dina, what about you in terms of kind of using your experience to co-create experiences for others around belonging? Mm. So um, there's a Nobel winning poet called uh, Derek Walcott and he, he, uh, he wrote a beautiful piece on um, being at home in ourselves. And there's a little passage in this, uh, in this poem that says, sit, feast on your life. And as Marco was speaking, I can imagine that that's the kind of visceral response that you allow for Marco, when you stand on a stage, you know, sit on a stage in a platform where people are like taking you in and seeing you in your beautiful way, feast on your life through stories. I love that you, you, um, introduced the art form of storytelling and how um how that all of a sudden softens the space between us because when i can listen to your story and feast on your life through your words then it builds a bridge of connection to my world and so in response to your question you know i often think of things as me we and all of us and notice I use me, we, all of us, and not me, we, they. Mm -hmm. I think, I feel we often other people. You know, this othering, they don't understand me, you know, they're better than me, they're not as good as me. And in the othering of others, this is where shame comes in. And I also feel that shame has a use, usefulness to it. We're feeling ashamed of something 
that we did or didn't do or thought or didn't think. Um, it can serve as a way for us to um, be called forth. So what do I want to do now that I'm shining a spotlight on something that has me feel uncomfortable? And the gift of this movement around Black Lives Matter is exactly that for me, who is sitting with a lot of things that are becoming more revealed, and then what do I want to do with this? So I'm, I'm in that space um, right now. And so for me, ways of belonging, you know, show up with, um, so me, myself, and I first. It is impossible for me to inspire others, be a steward for something that matters to me, unless I do the hard work first. And that often means putting the oxygen mask on myself and figuring out what do I now need? Otherwise, I'm busy blaming others for what I'm not giving to myself. So, so I would say that the me space is really important. The practice of being an integral coach, and I use that word deliberately, the practice of being an integral coach means that when I'm sitting with another human being, they are the only thing that matters to me in this moment. And I know that to be true because often people will say to me, the way in which I'm listening makes them feel like they matter and that they haven't been listened to quite that way before. And so there's, there's a quality of listening. I, I have a beautiful poem. If some of you are curious about it later, you can send me a note called Generous Listening. And it speaks to our capacity to really listen to receive, not listen to debate or refute or put down or argue. It's actually listening to receive the other person. And people can feel, Marco, people can feel when you're listening to them. And that's part of your superpower. I can feel it from Vancouver to, to Ottawa. Um, I would say that in my work, one of the things that I do extraordinary well is I help to create a sense of belonging on projects. So when we have cultural transformation projects, call it a strategic plan, or when we bring people together who are, I would say, interpersonal tension. So before it becomes needless conflict, to bring people together through interpersonal tension means that we have to do some hard work around elevating trust level. And the only way I know to do that is through storytelling. So I would say that that's something that animates me and, and really working around the values and the beliefs to spike trust so that we can actually be with each other. And then the third piece I would offer is the all of us space. And so my unique expression, the things that animate me is the work I do through Schoolbox. And that is, you know, in honor of a legacy piece of my sister, Tracy, where we go to Nicaragua, we fundraise to build classrooms to um, help make education possible for children um, that are learning under a tree. And so as partners with the community in an asset based community development kind of way, where we are companions to each other. So it's sustainable, it is life giving. Um, and it makes me feel in a very humble way that I'm nourishing something so deep inside of me that um, is helping support my need to um, make a difference. Excellent. Thank you. Um, Mark's written in the chat box about storytelling and just really appreciating that these conversations are an opportunity to share and tell stories and kind of bring people's experiences to life. And he also really appreciated, um, Dina, your me, we, all of us, and that we don't other um, people, that we are all part of this experience together. Um, I want to flip to times when you didn't belong. So we referenced that a little bit earlier and we said we'd circle back to it. So tell us about a time when that didn't feel good for you and what did you, what did that feel like, look like, how did you kind of reshape that to um, evolve both personally and to look forward. Yeah. Do you want to start with me? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can feel the the constriction already, right, around the, ooh, I didn't belong. And so um, I like to think of life as seasons. You know, we're born into spring, and then as we bloom, you know, we're summer, and then in the seasons of our life, you know, we move into fall. And then as we end our life, we're in winter, right? So there's a, 
uh, a season, holding life, our lifespan as, as seasons. And I would say that in my earlier days, you know, um, not quite fitting in as a teenager. And that was really hard for me because, um, and it's often I didn't belong because I was fighting for the young underdog. So I wasn't fitting in with the cliques because I didn't like that they were being clicky in the dramas. Um, and then being really attracted to sport and you know not belonging because I was one of the guys. And then moving into um, sport, not feeling I belonged when I was working in sport because I had a different way. I wanted to work differently. And um, transforming my career, which took a ton of courage to leave, something I had helped to give shape to around true sport, for instance, uh, leaving friends that I'd grown up with professionally, but not feeling like it was my place and not able, not being able to have the impact that I wanted to have, Andrea. So I would say, you know, um, now I feel, I feel really sad actually about where the world is at and COVID so grateful in a sense that it stopped the revolving nature of our lives where we're in, we've been interrupted, disrupted in a really important way, such as we can hear the voices of those um, that aren't as privileged, that haven't been getting the care and attention um, and I, I, so I feel really strongly that we're, we're all now questioning, what does it mean for us as a global citizen to belong? And I don't have any answers other than just to name that in this moment, you know? So your question really, it really hits right here where I'm still in deep, deep reflection around, well, what is my role and how can I serve? And and, and more information is what I need to be able to find the right language to express um, the sadness that I'm feeling right now. Yeah, it's been a pretty uh, a tumultuous time and it just seems like there's sort of one piece after another over the last few months that, you know, we work to sort of absorb, digest, figure out how you contribute to shaping something that's a better way forward without really knowing what the next phases of our lives are even going to look like given how much uncertainty we've faced over the last few months. Yeah. 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 What about you, Marco? Um, shaping some of the pieces or times that you haven't felt like you belonged. What does that look like, felt like transpired for, for you? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, it's, it's been quite difficult. I mean, at least in the early stages of my life, um, I would uh, venture to say that uh, the disability community is one of the remaining outlying uh, communities that's out there that doesn't get a lot of attention and, and sort of energy when it comes to uh, the discrimination and some of the things that happen in an environmental uh, kind of barrier, an attitudinal barrier aspect of things. That's something that I experienced really early on in my life. Uh, when I was in elementary school, I was bullied a lot just for having a disability. Um, and I thought, is this going to be what the rest of my life looks like? You know, uh, this can't be all that there is to it. Fortunately, I can say that once I hit high school, I had a really interesting experience. And I was, I grew up in the public school system and, and, and in an area of town that some might even consider um, to be a troubled area of town, you know, so you would have people from all walks of life coming to my school, all different backgrounds. But the ironic thing uh, there actually is that I felt a sense of more belonging in that school. I was never one that was pegged to the athletes, to the actors, to the this, to the that, all the cliques. I actually got along with every single person uh, in my high school, which was really, really good. And to bridge back to that sense of not belonging, I thought to myself, well, this is perfect. If high school is more of the representation of what the rest of my adult life will look like, then that's great. But unfortunately, then when I got out into the working world, um, you know, I had an, another sort of truth slapped across my face, which is not everyone is going to see things in that exact same way. In fact, in one of my very first uh, jobs in the video game industry, 
I ended up working for a very large company. And I remember, you know, they have things like team building events and things of this nature. Well, when I first started my job, this is unrelated to having a disability. I started out as a contractor, you know, like a part-time worker, that kind of thing. And it was weird because they had all these team building aspects and opportunities for people who were full-time employees, but they were literally segregating those who were contractors and part-time employees, but interacted with exactly the same team members. And I'll, I'll never forget the one moment that happened where they had a team building event where there was a soccer game where everyone would play, you know, uh, different, uh, different colors on each side and whatnot. And I remember someone approaching me and, and, uh, and saying like, oh, the office is clearing out, Marco. Uh, aren't you going to, to the team building event? And I said, what, what team building event? They're like, oh, well, there was an email that went out. Didn't, didn't you get the email? No, I, I didn't. And so uh, they brought it up to management and they go, well, not only is Marco a contractor and we don't really want to have team building events with contractors because you just don't know if they're going to be a part of our team full time, but also he's got a disability and we're playing soccer and we don't really know how we could integrate him into the scene and that sort of thing. And, you know, when I heard this type of information through the grapevine, I, I just, I was crushed, not because of that schoolyard feeling of wanting to feel like you get to play at recess with everybody else, but mm -hmm. simply because I was never brought into the conversation about how that opportunity could be adapted for myself or why somebody who was a contractor who interacted with the exact same group of people every single day just because of a label of what they're doing in the in the uh, company means that they're not allowed to belong and uh it was it was really really tough and i said to myself if i have an opportunity in the future to make an impact in a way where i can disseminate information to employers so that no matter what you're doing in an, an organization whether you're part-time whether you're a contractor whether you're full-time every single person has a sense of belonging and a sense that they get to do what they are meant to do which is interact with everyone and feel like a family uh, i think that the strongest companies that are out there are the ones that truly integrate the personalities and the experiences of the diversity of the workers that they bring to the table and those are the ones that don't say oh because of this or that there's these restrictions and ironically years later i would never have steered my way in the direction of supporting and helping employers but i think that that interaction stuck at the back of my mind and that's probably what influenced me to say no there's a better way and there's a different way and i'm so thrilled to see that so many more organizations are um, starting to introduce things like diversity and inclusion committees and um, employee resource groups so that everyone has a sense of belonging and it's not just the visible disabilities but it's also the invisible things like mental health challenges and this is something that is so prevalent now especially because we're at, at homes running our businesses or, or, or participating as an employee in our businesses but there are great change makers that are out there i actually see that alexa from access now is actually in on the call as a listener and access now if you don't know about them um, their founder, Mayan Ziv, is an amazing influencer and leader in the space of finding accessible spaces and places where everyone can sort of pin on Google Maps uh, and using their app to find places that are accessible where you can have that sense of belonging. And it's going to take individuals like myself, like Mayan, like Alexa, like everybody in these teams to really say, look, this is our experience, but we're now in 2020 no matter what's going on in the world and that the fact that there is divisiveness and there is separation that's a choice as well we can all choose to uh parry on to that narrative or we can choose to change the conversation to something more positive and say yes absolutely there's been these times where people have felt like they don't belong or they have been separated but what am i as an individual going to do to change that conversation and i think that we all have to take responsibility in changing that conversation Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Andrea, Andrea there's, yeah. a, there's a question from mm -hmm. Mark here um, around the othering and, and he was asking for another example. Are, are you comfortable if I ping off what Marco just said? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so Marco, you're just a delight to take in, not going to lie. This is like amazing to, um, to, to, to feel the energy and often it's about the questions that we ask. So what's coming up for me, another way that we other people is we go along and we, um, we make assumptions. So that's a way of othering someone. So it can be as simple as 
the, my preference to communicate um, is to, you know, barge into someone's office and saying, hey, um, uh, I, where are you on the project? Because I make the assumption that my way of communication, my pre preferential style is the same as others. And so othering people can also be as simple as making assumptions about what their beliefs are, their values, what matters to them, what doesn't matter to them. And what interrupts assumptions is powerful questions. So the next time for all of us on the, on the call to kind of disrupt that, and, and Marco was inviting us into this space, all Marco needed was a, hey, Marco, we've got this, you know, so set aside the titling thing, which I love. You know, we've got this, uh, this planned activity, and we want, to, we want to ensure you're included. So what would that look like for you? And if that had happened, Marco, what would have happened? If somebody had said to you yeah no absolutely i think like for example i it wouldn't have made me feel like i was less than it would actually made me feel like i was being brought into the conversation about me because it's not about their lack of understanding i think the reason why a lot of organizations don't bring these things up is they don't want to appear ignorant and they don't want to feel as though uh oh i'm singling you out but the irony is is that you're doing both of those things by not bringing me into the conversation Right. And so by bringing me in and allowing me to tell you what my restrictions may or may not be, you actually might have an eye opening experience where I'm actually changing the way that other people, my other fellow employees experience the whole soccer game simply because I was given the opportunity to belong and be a part of that situation. So that absolutely would have been fantastic. Amen. And here's like Marco's, uh, not Mark is saying to Marco's response, and it's simple. So don't, here's a little note for all of us to remember, don't let my discomfort, I don't know what to say, I don't wanna hurt his feelings, get in the way of right action, is what Marco's saying. Ask me, or do the hard work of being informed enough to even know like, okay, this is awkward, we don't have a policy around this, but you matter to us, and maybe this isn't the best team building you know, activity, so in what way can we create team building activities that are inclusive right and what would that look like marco ask yeah i actually have a very quick example that i can tail into that uh where it did happen for me which was in high school like i said a place where i felt very much like i belonged i had a pe teacher that never and i, I should say drama uh, no surprise there and pe were my two favorite classes in high school um, but PE surprises people because they go, well, what was that like for you? You know, everyone was doing running and things like this, but I had the most amazing PE teacher who said, who did ask those questions and who did make adaptions. And I've told this story, uh, when I've given talks in the past, but, uh, games like dodgeball, and I don't know if they play it much in high school anymore just because of injuries, but we played it a lot in my high school. We called and it murder ball. There we go. Exactly. <laughs> and, uh, and this teacher, he said, well, if we want Marco to be involved, we want him to play. So I'm going to make one adapted rule. And so the students were like, okay, what's that? They said, okay, well, if you hit Marco in the body, it counts. But if you, uh, but if you hit him in the wheelchair, it doesn't actually count. Well, the great thing that happened here was now I was actually being the first person chosen on every team because my fellow students could use me as a shield to block the balls. And I could actually take those dodgeballs and store them in the spokes of my wheels like a Gatlin gun and just kind of unload them on other students. So, you know, it was oh. interesting because what some might say was an unfair advantage was actually the equalizer that made me on the same plane as every other student. And it was just one simple rule change. So anyone who says it's difficult, that's just hogwash. It's not difficult, it just takes creativity. And I thank my teachers and all the people who showed care and loving and understanding for me. That's why I have such a um, appreciation for physical fitness today. That's awesome. Um, Veronica asked a question in the chat box about how you start that conversation around including and challenging the assumptions. So, um, Marco, do you want to lead with answering that question? Because I think it's a, you know, one that you've probably encountered a number of times and you've given some examples of how that's evolved for you already. 
Absolutely. Uh, quite simply, it's going to sound almost placating, but it literally goes back to what Dina was saying, which is literally just ask the person. So as opposed to singling it out to do with anything to do with a disability or anything of that nature, just say, what can we do to best support you to excel in your role? Has there been other things that you've done in the past in either work experiences or in your lived experience that support you in making situations easier or, or actually make you more productive? And I, you know, I kid you not there are so many people that are not going to get offended by that in fact they're going to appreciate that you're asking them from the perspective of look i want to make sure that you're being effective that you're productive that you like being here that you feel like you belong just in that simple question of what can we do to best support you and what has supported you in the past by framing it in that way the person is then going to tell you what is there and then then when it comes to things like accommodations and things like that that can all be worked out later on Many employers think that it's going to cost a lot of money to accommodate uh, an individual with a disability, when, it, when in fact they've actually shown statistics that it's about $500 on average uh, to accommodate for most uh, disabilities and or conditions. And in fact, in, in many cases, it's less than that. It's zero dollars because it takes things like hmm, having an adjustable desk so that the, if uh, I want to have a standing desk or I don't want to bash my knees on a desk, that I can move the desk up and down. Or having task lighting if somebody has low vision uh, or, or they need magnification for things like uh, what they're doing on their computer. A lot of times these things don't cost a lot of money, but they make a big impact in terms of somebody feeling like they're bringing them full self to work or in their personal life. Yeah, that's uh, some fantastic, really tangible examples as well. Thank you for that. I think one of the pieces, and Dina started to write in sort of the asking, don't tell. We talked earlier about sort of co-creating experiences. And, you know, one of the pieces in my diversity and inclusion work that has been so strong for me in terms of how we message is creating with, not for. So coming back to sort of that assumptions piece and how do we really... Um, you know, work with folks to understand what's going to work for them and creating something together. So I'm going to uh, flip to a couple other questions. So um, maybe Dina, I'll turn this one to you. So Mark um, uh, asked how we define normal and sort of adaptation changing normal and what are some of the multiple variations of ways to play rather than focusing on changing um, and ad adapting for the person. So kind of how do we flip the narrative so that we look at a different version of normal? And I wow. think that really works Thanks, for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so here's a couple of things. Here's what's pinging for me. The first is, um, you know, I think that the only thing that is the same is that we are different. So if we go in with an assumption that the other human being many of the things that I see are partial. So I can look at someone and make some inferences and there's some really good books around cognitive bias and everything that is really helpful for us to go into a relationship and always know that hidden to me is all these assumptions that I might be holding. So if we go into every single conversation and conversation means dialogue with someone. So I just want people to really feel that, right? How many of us are having versations, not conversations? And so if we can remember that when I'm with another human being, it is partial. I only know a portion of this human being. I need them to teach me how it is that they want to be treated and what language opens up dialogue and space and what language closes down. So if I can hold that, and then if I miss my mark, you know, in response to somebody else's question, like, ouch, I don't want to hurt you. Silencing is another form of being, you know, staying invisible in the conversation. So I'm not going to say anything because I'm afraid of hurting people's feelings or tripping on toes. So I would say being really mindful of, um, and as Marco said, maybe it's better to say something and attempt, you know, to initiate something than it is to stay as a passive observer and watch the bullying carrying out to the bully, right? So, um, so that's what's coming up, uh, you know, up for me, uh, Andrea, around some of the ways in which the invisible things that separate us and keep us separated um, cr creates distance between us. 
And so if we can come into conversations with a humble heart, a teach me kind of attitude, and recognize that if I get it wrong, that I can do the right work of, you know, when I mess up, I fess up and I make it right. So, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to offend you. It doesn't excuse my poor literacy here, but I, I'm, I'm really deeply sorry. What might be language or a practice or a process or a policy that's going to help make this right? Because so much of our, our practices and policies in sport are not quite there yet. And for many, they're not even close to being quite there yet. And Marco, you've shared that. And then, and then the beautiful question of, in what way can I help you make this right? And then be prepared. If you offer to make things right, and you can feel the shift in my language, do not be a promise breaker. Because the people that are vulnerable have been told promise after promise after promise. So if you can't hold true, to what it is that you say you're going to do, then it is best to not say it at all. Those are some thoughts that come to mind. Excellent. I love how you uh, shifted your whole approach. Do not break the promise. <laughs> Marco, do you want to layer into what Dina's just articulated? Absolutely. I, I honestly think that it, first of all, I echo everything you just said, and I think that it comes down to intention. Okay, uh, everybody uh, sets out hopefully with the right intentions when they go out to set a policy or a procedure or changing uh, the way in which you're approaching something. Uh, if there's anything I've learned in working with the business leaders I've worked with is the companies that get it right are the ones that set the tone from the top. So this can't be a buy-in that's just an HR initiative that you're just saying, oh, well, HR said it's a good thing to do and look how diverse we are now. Check, check, check. That's not what it's about. You actually have to make sure that the leaders of your organization have buy-in and they understand the importance of that diversity and bringing in um, those unique perspectives to your organization and how that can positively change the bottom line of the organization. Because let's be real, I know that within business, you know, it does come back to bottom line you know how can our organization be successful how can we succeed how can we continue to make a profit that is what business is i understand that but the organizations that are really successful recognize that the diversity of their employees are actually what bring such life and such interesting energy to an organization and and not to like bash on tech companies because i'm still very much in the tech scene but tech companies actually do really good things. Uh, for example, you know, think uh, organizations like Google and Microsoft, they have these opportunities for, uh, you know, moments during the day where you can self innovate and actually take some time away from your desk and do all these things. Some of these practices, why aren't we plucking them to different industries? Why aren't we using some of these things where we're allowing people to have innovative moments, to have inspirational uh, talks and feelings and discussions? Because that's honestly where you pull out some of the greatest ideas that maybe haven't been activated yet. And there may be hidden skill sets or, or uh, individuals within your organization that have these skills that they just have been so nervous to bring to the forefront. And to uh, Dina's point earlier, you know, sometimes these things are hidden or we, because of our biases, we see that somebody is always looking at their watch during a meeting and you go, I, I really dislike that person. They're so rude. But what you don't know is what's going on behind the scenes. Maybe they're waiting to hear back on something really important. Maybe there's a family member who's in the hospital right now and they're waiting to hear a very important call. We can't layer our uh, assumptions on people uh, just because we see what is in front of us and assume that that is our reality. So set the right intentions and build an army of really positive people around you to help um, you know, create that environment and to create that movement. And you'll see some amazing things start to happen. Oh, that was fantastic, Marco, thank you. And Wanda was really appreciating um, the talk, your points around the leadership needing to be bought in and demonstrated. So we're at a time in our journey together where it's actually time to wrap up. This always goes really fast. Um, so I know <laughs> these are always rich discussions and I feel like we could talk for hours. Um, Dina, do you want to do some last words and then I'll turn it to Marco? Sure. So, um, so a couple of things, uh, Marco, I wanted to say thank you because I wrote down here, I wanted to belong as a human being. That was one of the first things and you know, I have a box of Kleenex here close by. Um, thank you for that. Because that is my experience. It's like beyond the titles and the ability or the disability 
or the color of my skin. I want to feel like I matter. And the only way we know how to do that is to forge that through relationship and conversation. So thank you. That That's such a, a humble gift to remember that behind the title of this human being, which Andrea, you know, we're saying here, yes, leaders need to step up. I would humbly offer that it is incumbent on all of us. So if you're in an environment where the leaders are not stepping up, are you going to be the brave person to actually say something? So I, I, I'll leave you with that. And as a final little gift here, I just, maybe I'll read um, a little something here from David White. Is that okay? Because he, he speaks to the belonging, and I'll, I'll begin where I, I, you know, maybe I'll end where I began around belonging to self first. And here's what David uh, White says about this. To feel as if you belong is one of the great tri triumphs of human existence, and especially to sustain a life of belonging and to invite others into that. But it's interesting to think that our sense of slight woundedness around not belonging is actually one of our core competencies. That through the crow is just itself, and the stone is just itself, and the mountain is just itself, and the cloud and the sky is just itself. We are the one part of creation that knows what it's like to live in exile. And that the ability to turn your face towards home is one of the great endeavors and the great human stories. And the moment you've uttered the exact dimensionality of your exile, you've already taken the path back to the way back to the place you should be, you're already on your way home. So David is inviting us to return to ourself and in so doing, liberating ourselves from ego and all the other stuff that gets in the way of our way and the other person's way. Thank you, David White. Uh, and you've been uh, reading a lot of David White to me lately, and uh, I'm just really appreciating the gifts of his words each time and the gift of you bringing it to me. So thank you for that. And thank you so much for being here today. Delighted. Marco, I'm going to turn to you for your last words, and then I'll wrap us up. Okay. Final words would be, don't wait to take action, take action today. If there's anything that uh, remote work has shown us is that the things that we didn't think were possible are actually possible. And there are new and innovative ways in which we can connect with each other, which are shining a light on the importance of human connection. So although uh, it's being encouraged that we social distance, that doesn't mean that we'd have to emotionally distance. And I think that people, especially now more than ever, need that emotional connection. And this is not to you know make it very very sappy or things like this but at the end of the day we are human beings and there is a purpose for us being on this planet to make a difference and make an impact in whatever role we play so regardless if you are the CEO of a company or the janitor as has been said we have an opportunity to you know bring that perspective to the table shine new light on it show people what's truly important and let your best self shine so thank you so much for the opportunity to speak about this. And uh, yeah, if anyone wants to uh, learn more about what I do, they can find my website and, uh, and there you go. <laughs> Amazing. Oh my gosh. Um, another incredible week with uh, two remarkable humans who I both value and appreciate greatly having in my life. So thank you for saying yes. Thank you for being here today. And um, it was another, it was just such a rich conversation and, um, you two interacted so well. It's always fun to sort of bring two people together that really don't know each other and um, connect them in this way and have some rich dialogue. So thank you for that. Um, we are wrapping up for another week. So thank you to everyone that joined us. I want to invite you to join us next week, next Wednesday, uh, the 24th. And we have um, Kristen Worley, who is a human-centered design consultant and um, a transgender woman who uh, really broke through some of the barriers in uh, uh, gender diversity through her journey in cycling. And then Darby Lee Young, who um, runs a company called Level Playing Field, who really looks at accessible design. So we're going to have a bit of a design focus next week, talking about some of the spaces and places where um, people belong. So really excited to offer that forward. And uh, again, just so grateful to Marco and Dina for saying yes and being here today and to our audience for joining us. So thank you, stay well, and uh, have a great week. <laughs>